bless me that I can say something that is glorifies Mr. Gadez, glorifies Salad Maharaj, and is helpful to the photos. Om Agyana Timurangasya Gyananya Charakaya Chakshur Unmilitam Gyana Tasmai Shri Gurave. Panchakalpa Talubiyas Cha Krita Sindhu Videva Cha Patitanam Pamanibyo Vaishnavibyo Namaha. Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shivanti Gaur Bhakta Hare Krishna Hare Krishna Krishna Krishna, Krishna Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama Jai Mishringa! <laughs> so tonight, um, I want to talk about Lord Mishringa Dev. Um, through, we can approach this pastime in so many different ways. There's so much to say, and there's so many different aspects of both the Lord and his relationship with his devotees. But I wanted to take tonight and talk about this pastime in the context of how do we recognize a devotee? How do we know who is a devotee? How do we know when we ourselves are making some progress in becoming the Lord's devotee? So one of my first questions, because I remember my children asking me this, is why do we tell the same stories over and over? Right. Everybody knows the story of the Shringadev, right? So I'll just skip that and we'll go into the deep esoteric meaning. Well, actually we can't because I'm not qualified to talk about the deep esoteric. But fortunately, the pastime itself is deep and esoteric. In fact, Srila Prabhupada says that Nishringadev appears for everyone. Now, he doesn't appear just for Prahlad Maharaj. He appears for everyone. And by hearing this pastime, we actually become purified. Um, Prabhupada says, anyone who chants and hears about the activities of Prahlad Maharaj and in relationship with Prahlad's activities, the activities of Nishringadev, gradually becomes free from all the bondage of fruitive activities. So if we just hear this pastime, we're actually purifying our hearts, we're actually making progress um, going back to God. I also want to share one little realization I had when I was studying for this class. Um, the importance of reading. And you know, we talk about the importance of reading Srimad Bhagavatam, reading Bhagavad Gita, and reading Prabhupada's commentaries on those texts. Um, it's kind of a given. But one thing I realized when I was reading, as opposed to hearing somebody give a lecture on those verses, is that I have my own realizations. Right? You know, I mean, it's not, it's not a last slide, but they're important. They're important because those are the realizations that Krishna is giving me at this time. It's a, it's a reciprocation between me and the Lord, between me and Srila Prabhupada. So I, I just want to share that because I want all of you to also have those exchanges, to also get in the habit of thinking, what are my realizations? Because that's one of the ways that we keep track of how we're moving in forward in Krishna consciousness, and it's also one of the ways that we feel, wow, Krishna's really reciprocating with me, you know, we actually have a relationship. All right, so, so where do we start? We'll start with chapter one, in which Jai and Vijay are cursed. All right, so we can take up this story at many different points. We could talk about who are Jai and Vijay and where do they come from, but for our purposes, We'll start at the point at which they are the, door, the gatekeepers for Lord Vishnu. And their job is to keep out unqualified persons. So remember, we're going to talk about how do we recognize a devotee. All right? So four little kids, naked little kids, um, show up at the door and they want to see Lord Vishnu. Right? And what did Jai and Vijay do? They don't let him in. They say, no, you're not qualified. You can't have personal association with the Lord, you know, because you don't look like devotees. But they were devotees. They were the sons of Brahma who decided they were going to stay in these um, bodies of small children because they didn't want to have to follow their father's instruction of growing up and 
having progeny to populate the universe. And they said, no, that's too entangling. <coughs> we don't want to do that. You know, we want to focus on spiritual life. Not only are we going to be eternal brahmacharis, but we're going to be five years old. We're going to be little kids, so that we don't have to even deal with all that stuff. All right? And they got mad at Jai and Jai. You know, little kids, when you tell them they can't have something, right? I hate you. So, you know, at a transcendental level, a similar thing happens. And they say, we curse you to go to the material world. All right? Now, poor Jai and Jai, right? Honest mistake. Right? Trying to do their job, that's their job, right? So you think, you might think that Lord Vishnu, when he came out to see what was going on, might say, hey, I'm sorry, you know, these guys are a little strict, no problem, come on in. But he doesn't do that. He upholds the curse. And why, why does he do that? He doesn't like Jai and Vijay? The four Kumaras are so cute, he just can't resist. What is it? Well, one of the reasons is to show the importance of not offending devotees. So from this, we can understand that because someone does not appear like a devotee to our eyes is not the most important test. Right? So we're supposed to serve and respect devotees. We're supposed to um, give honor to devotees. Right. So what do we do if we don't know what a devotee looks like? What's the solution? We just won't go out in public, so we just don't run the risk of offending any devotee. Anybody have an idea? Veronica. Serve everybody. Serve everybody. That's it. You know. So this is a lesson in humility. Um, the other point here is that the Lord can't forgive us when we offend a devotee. The devotee has to forgive us. Just like when Jagai, I always get Jagai and Mane mixed up. Jagai <coughs> was the one who said, you know, look, you forgave Marai, you know, why can't you forgive me? And the other way around. Okay, so Marai says, I'm lost already. Um, <laughs> One says, you forgave the other one, how come you can't forgive me? And, the, and Lord Chaitanya says, you offended Lord Nityananda. You hit him in the head, you made him bleed. He has to forgive you. And of course, Lord Nityananda died. But that's one lesson that we get from the beginning of this pastime. Now, the Lord, I like to say this, Krishna is the ultimate multitasker. So, you know, he has a purpose in allowing this curse to go forward. There's going to come something wonderful from having Jai and Vijay fall into the material world. And they were given a choice. Seven lifetimes as devotees or three lifetimes as demons, as enemies of Lord Vishnu. And they said, we want the shorter sentence, so we'll, we'll become demons. Um, and, and one reason is that Krishna, he likes to fight. He likes to have competition and battle. And really, he can't have that with just anyone. The Lord's not going to have that kind of intimate relationship with just anyone. He needs it to be his devotee. But to really enjoy that rasa battle, the, the devotees have to forget that they're devotees. Right? Otherwise, how could they fight with the Lord to you know, their full potency? All right, so that's chapter one. Chapter two, Jaya and Vijaya go down to the material world. They take birth as brothers, Hiranyaksha and Hiranyakashipu. And there's a whole wonderful pastime about how Lord Vishnu kills Hiranyaksha. And we pick up our story um, where Hiranyakashipu becomes the sworn enemy of Lord Vishnu, if he wasn't you know, already the sworn enemy, but even more determined to defeat Lord Vishnu after Lord Vishnu kills his brother. So now, now it's on. You know, it's, it's a blood debt. You know, we're not, you know, this is it. No going back from here. So his first, the first thing he does is tell his followers to attack the places where the Vedas are worshipped and where religious principles are followed. So why? why does, any ideas why he does this? He's trying to take away Lord Vishnu's power. 
In other words, he wants to get rid of God. Um, he's nothing if not self-conscious. You know, he's, he's not afraid to take on a big task. And not only is he ambitious and confident, he actually has some spiritual knowledge. After his brother's death, he tells his mother, you know, and, his, and um, the rest of the relatives, look, you know, you shouldn't lament for the dead. The soul is eternal. He preaches the instructions of Lord Ram, Lord Yamaraj, there we go. Lord Ramaraj on this point. So he actually, he has made acknowledge. Um, and then he's, he's an ascetic. He has the ability to do austerities that we can't even imagine. So after he's tried, he's got the universe kind of destabilizing, um, and he's got his family members prepared for this all-out war with Lord Vishnu. He goes to Mandara Mountain and meditates to get potency. And his meditation is so intense, it goes on for, I don't know, thousands of years. Um, and, <coughs> and like his whole body is wasted away. He's a skeleton covered by an anthill. But his meditation is so intense that it's, it's causing the universe to be off balance. It's causing everyone in the universe to suffer because there's so much heat being generated that no one can breathe, no one can, can function. And the demigods go to Lord Vishnu and say, help, you know, they think, what can we do, what can we do? Oh, you know, only one, only one place we can go, Lord Vishnu. And the Lord says, don't worry, I'll take care of it. And this, this is an example of what Krishna says in Gita, yada yada hi dharmasya dvanya bhavati bharata asitanama dharmasya taratmanam srijanya. Whenever and wherever there is a decline in religious principles and a rise in irreligion, at that time I defend myself. So here's a promise. Here's a promise Krishna is giving us that when irreligion becomes potent, he's going to come. You know, religious principles, our ability to connect with God, bhakti yoga, love for God, these things can never disappear. Because Krishna has promised that when someone tries to disturb them, um, he's going to come and, and uh, reestablish himself. So, you know, a little foreshadow. Krishna's, Krishna's getting ready. Lord Vishnu's getting ready. Meanwhile, Lord Brahma, as the head of the universe, goes to Hiranyakashipu and says, okay, you know, you're doing all these austerities, obviously you want something. What is it that you want? And he tells Lord Brahma, I want to be immortal. I don't ever want to die. And Lord Brahma says, I can't do that. I don't have that power. I can't give you what I don't have. But Hiranyakashipu, he has great faith in his abilities and great faith in his intelligence. So he thinks, okay, can't give me immortality. All right, how's this? I don't want to be killed on the land, in the water, or in the air. I don't want to be killed by a man or an animal. I don't want to be killed in the daytime or the nighttime. I don't want to be killed by any weapon. And each <coughs> thing that he proposes, Lord Brahma says, okay, fine, fine, fine. And Hirani Kachipu finally thinks he's got it all covered. Now he's really confident. He's figured it out. He's got it down, right? His plans are working perfectly. During this time, however, his wife, she must have been pregnant for thousands of years, because it's like disturbing. <laughs> but she was pregnant, you know, while he's meditating. All this time he's meditating on, uh, on Mount Mandara. His wife is carrying a child. And at one point, the demigods, you know, come across her, and they say, we've, we've captured our enemy's wife. And not only that, she's pregnant, and she's pregnant with a son. So here's our opportunity. We're going to, you know, cut off this lineage. Um, and I think Narada tells them they can't kill a woman. Somebody says we can't kill a woman. And they, then they decide, okay, we're going to wait until the child is born, and they're going to kill the child. Right? So we're talking again about... How do you recognize a devotee? Okay. She's the wife of the greatest demon in the universe, and this is the son of the greatest demon in the universe. So of course, he's going to be a great demon. 
We have to have a preemptive strike. But Narada Muni explained that this child will actually be a great devotee. So it doesn't matter the family. Obviously, good family gives us a better chance to take advantage of spiritual knowledge and to practice spiritual knowledge. But great souls can come from demoniac families. So again, that reminder to be humble and to treat everyone with respect, because we don't know. We don't know who someone is. Not only does Narada take Kayadu to his ashram, but she serves him there, and he teaches her Vedic knowledge. And Prahlad, in her womb, becomes purified, becomes a surrendered soul, just from hearing Narada's teaching. So he hasn't even been born yet, right? And he's become purified by hearing these teachings. The potency of a devotee and the potency of spiritual knowledge when it's given to us by a pure devotee can't be underestimated. The other point that we can we can see here is Hirani Kashipu had all kinds of qualifications. He had spiritual knowledge. He was intelligent. Um, you know, he had quite a brain. You know, lawyer's mind. You know, this clause and this clause, not like this, not like this, not like this. Right? And his wife, on the other hand, simple person. Um, she followed her husband when he was a demon. She followed Narada, you know, into the ashram. And when her husband came back, she went back to her husband. You know, but the knowledge was given to her. So again, it's not our material qualifications that allow us to access spiritual knowledge. It's the service attitude. Because she served Narada, she was given the opportunity to hear. Well, Hirani Kashipu, having gotten what he wanted from Lord Brahma, he, he's taken over the universe. He's kicked Indra out of Indra's palace, and he's living. Indra's the king of the demigods. Hirani Kashipu is living in his palace. Not only that, but all of the demigods are in so much fear of Hirani Kashipu that they're actually worshiping him. Right? So instead of people worshiping the demigods and the demigods giving that worship to Lord Vishnu, the demigods are actually worshiping Hirani Kashipu out of fear. They're giving him gifts. They're saying prayers to him. Narada Muni himself is worshiping Hirani Kashipu. So it, you know, it's looking bad for religious principles at this point. It's, it's, it's looking dangerous. Hirani Kashipu had everything that anyone could need to enjoy materially. Right? He had, you know, he was constantly intoxicated. He had all the women he wanted. You know, we, we think sex, drugs, and rock and roll was invented in the 60s. No, you know, Hirani Kashipu had that going on. <laughs> all right. Um, so what happened? In Bhagavatam, it is said, in spite of achieving the power to control in all directions, and in spite of enjoying all types of sense gratification as much as possible, Hirani Kashipu was dissatisfied because instead of controlling his senses, he remained their servant. So I don't know about the rest of you, but I sometimes, most of the time, suffer from the delusion that if I could get material circumstances just so, I would be happy, right? You know, if I didn't have these financial worries, if I didn't have these health worries, if I didn't have to work so hard, if it weren't so cold, if it weren't so hot, if I weren't so tall, if I weren't so short, you know, whatever it is, we're always thinking somehow I can become happy by arranging the material energy. But here, Ryan Kashipu stands for the principle, among other things, that it does not matter how much material facility you have. Happiness does not come from material facility. It comes from controlling the senses, is what it says here. Because he did not control the senses, he remained unhappy. So our modern life tells us the more we enjoy the senses, the more we serve the senses, the happier we're going to be. There's a whole culture and a whole lot of resources and you know, money behind the, promoting the idea that 
the more you enjoy your senses, the better your life is. Right? Absolutely opposite of the truth. Prabhupada says that what Hirani Kashipu was doing was he was trying to enjoy the kingdom of God without serving God. In other words, he captured all of the resources, all of the energy of the Lord that's manifested in the universe and the material modes of nature. He captured it all, but he didn't want to serve God. In fact, he wanted to kill God. Okay. So, don't do that. You know, that's the lesson here. Don't do that. <laughs> all right. The relationship with God, that's where our real happiness lies. So even if we haven't perfected ourselves, as long as we keep that in mind, we're heading in the right direction. All right, so I don't know if we're at chapter three or chapter four, but this is the chapter where Prahlad drives his father crazy. Okay. So Prahlad, having heard from Narada Muni, has been a pure devotee since birth. And he's, he's a small child, five years old, he's going to school, he has friends, he's a typical five-year-old child. And his father has great affection for him. His father loves him very much. And one day, as fathers do, he takes the lot on his lap and he says, what is the best thing you have learned? What did you learn in school today, son? And Prahlad says, I've learned that the best thing in life is to give up material consciousness and to worship Lord Vishnu. What? Lord Vishnu? My sworn enemy? Eternal enemy? Or, you know, oh my gosh, someone has brainwashed this child. What is going to get his teachers in here? And the teachers come. And, you know, Hirani Kashipu lays it out. Look, you know, clear this up. Take care of this. You know, I don't want my son learning this nonsense. And the teachers speak to Prahlad. And Prahlad tells them that they need to give up this false mentality of ownership. And everybody's like, where did you learn this? So they, they endeavor to teach him. They teach him all about politics, friends and enemies. And Prahlad doesn't accept it. He doesn't see that there are friends and enemies. He doesn't want any part of that idea. So this is an idea that is so inherent in most people's consciousness. You know, even if we don't think of like enemies as someone we're going to kill, but we always, at least I do, people on my side, people on the other side, people on my team, people I know, people I don't know, you know, it's like all these categories and divisions and ways of separating myself from others. And normally when I'm mentally separating myself from others, I'm doing it in such a way that I'm a little bit better, or a lot better, than those other categories, right? Because, you know, obviously people who, you know, wear silk saris are much fuller than people who wear cotton saris. But, you know, just whatever. You know, but that's it. It's like, you know, this idea that um, I'm part of this group and I'm going to conquer that group or, or, you know, be better than that group. And Prahlad didn't, didn't see things. So, back to his father, all right? What did he learn? Well, let me tell you about the nine processes of devotional service by which you can worship Lord Vishnu. It doesn't learn, okay? So now Hiranyakashipu, you know, forget the love of the child. This, this goes beyond, you know, father-son relationship. Traitor, you're a traitor. So my servants are going to kill you. So we think, sometimes we think this, you know, horrible things are unique to modern life, but you know, ages and ages ago, here's a father who's trying to kill his son, but he doesn't want to do it himself. He's going to have his servants do it. So they try so many ways to kill Prahlad. What are the ways? You, you know. Shot him out. Throw him off a cliff. Throw him off a cliff. Okay. What else? Elephants. Elephants. Have him smashed by elephants. Poisonous snake. Poisonous snakes in a pit of poisonous snakes. Fire. Fire. Boiling ghee. <laughs> Cutting him with weapons. Right? We did snakes, yeah. Poison in his food, right? Poison, poison that he eats. Um, cold. And I'm probably forgetting, but you know. But you get the idea that they were pretty serious about this. You know, they, they, were, they weren't fooling around. Um, so what happened? You know, nothing. How many five-year-old children, how many, what, anybody of any age, can withstand even one of these things? But Prahlad depended upon the Lord, and the Lord protected him from each one 
of these dangerous situations. So maybe that's why, at the end of all of this, when they finally realize they couldn't kill Prahlad and they sent him back to school, maybe that's why he's not afraid. <laughs> he's not afraid to go on telling about the worship of Lord Vishnu. So not only does he continue to preach in this way, he preaches to his classmates, and they actually become devotees. Because they're young children and, and they haven't been so conditioned, they're open to him when he tells them that the best thing to do is to worship Lord Vishnu, that we should control our senses, and that this time that we have, even though we're young, all of this time should be used for learning to control our senses and worship the Lord. And one of the things that, that we learn here is how does a devotee handle difficulty? Because everybody gets it. You know, sometimes we think, why is the Lord doing this to me? Right? Lord, why why have you put me in this situation? Don't you love me? If you love me, you wouldn't do this to me. But we see in so many different places, other scriptures, our scriptures, you know, Prabhupada's life so many places that being the Lord's servant, loving the Lord and having the Lord love us, does not mean that we're never going to face difficulties. We will. You know. So the question is, how do we respond to those difficulties? Because the way we respond to them affects how those difficulties affect us. Right? If you're in a situation where something bad is going on and you get into that, why me? And it's everybody else's fault, and I hate everybody for doing this to me. You're going to suffer a lot more than if you understand, hey, you know, this is something that's happening. I've got to deal with it. In psychology, they call that resilience. If you can be resilient, then you suffer less. Okay? On a spiritual level, it's even more true that if we understand what's really going on, how the universe really works, then we're not so affected. And we can actually make spiritual progress in times of difficulty. But Prahlad gives us the example of in every difficulty, just take shelter of the Lord. You know, he's five years old, he doesn't really have a lot of options. His parents aren't on his side, you know. Um, all of his friends are also five years old, so you know, they're not going to be able to save him. He really doesn't have any other option, but he consistently does it. You know, there's no doubt in his mind, never at any point does he say, wow. You know, if Krishna really loved me, why is, why is this happening? This is, it's not relevant to him. He just takes shelter of the Lord, and he's protected at each step. So at this point, Shringadev decides, you know, this kid is never going to learn, and no one else can take care of this, so I'm going to have to kill him myself. And he gets into a debate with Prahlad. You know, where are you getting your power? Prahlad says, I'm getting it from the same place you get yours. Which Hiranyakashipu didn't want to hear that. He didn't want to hear that his power came from anywhere outside himself. He didn't want to owe anybody anything, right? This is me, my power. I'm the coolest. You know, nobody gave me anything. I earned it by my own austerity. Did you ever feel like that? You know? I accomplished this. Right? So that's you know, that's, the more I talk, the more I'm thinking, wow, you know, we're supposed to be like Prahlad, but, you know, is anybody relating to Hirani Kashipu at this point? Because I am, you know? So it's like, which way am I going to lean, you know? Um, all right, so he, he says to Prahlad, you know, where is his God? If this, you, you're claiming your power comes from God, and why can't I see him? You know, where is he? And Prahlad says, he's everywhere. Is he... Here? Is he in this pillar? So he says, yeah. And at this point, I guess Shringadev decided it was time for his grand entrance, and he appeared. It's said that in the Bhagavatam that he, the pillar broke with a sound so loud that the demigods thought their, their planets were being destroyed. You, know, you can't even conceive of how loud this sound is. The Lord coming down to reestablish religion and to save his devotion. And I, I'm just going to read the description of Lord Nishragadev because it's really wonderful. Hirani Kashipu studied the form of the Lord, trying to decide who the form of Nishragadev standing before him was. 
The Lord's form was extremely fearsome because of his angry eyes, which resembled molten gold, his shining mane, which expanded the dimensions of his fearful face, his deadly teeth and his razor-sharp tongue, which moved about like a dueling sword. His ears were erect and motionless, and his nostrils and gaping mouth appeared like the caves of a mountain. His jaws parted fearfully, and his entire body touched the sky. His neck was very short and thick, his chest broad, his waist thin, and the hairs on his body as white as the rays of the moon. His arms, which resembled flanks of soldiers, spread in all directions as he killed demons, rubes, and atheists with his conch shell, disc, lotus, club, and other natural weapons. So he's got white fur, right? his eyes are goldish red, like gold heated to the melting point. His mane is full, he's got sharp teeth. So he appears, and most of us, you know, might be a little taken aback, <laughs> a little scared even, but not here around the right? He's confident. He's talented. He's intelligent. He's a great warrior, and he's he's ready. Let's go. Lord Vishnu has finally appeared. I'm going to kill him. And. The, as the fight goes on, Lord Nishrini Dave, it said he's playing with Hiranyakashipu like a, a cat with a mouse. So there's a point at which Hiranyakashipu thinks, hey, I'm winning here. You know, he's scared of me. He's running away. Um, but ultimately, the Lord kills him. But now, how can the Lord do this? Because Brahma made all these promises, right? So he has to keep the word of his devotee, which is the reason why he appeared in this form as half man, half lion because Hirani Kashipu is not going to be killed by a man or an animal. Um, he sits in the doorway, so it's not inside or outside. It's exactly at twilight, so it's not day, it's not night. He places Hirani Kashipu on his lap, so it's not the earth, it's not the air, it's not water. And he doesn't use any weapon. He uses his fingers. So he, basically, he disembowels Hirani Kashipu. And which Andrew Nyman Prabhu told me something this morning that I thought was really wonderful, so I'm going to share it. Hiranya Kashipu was taking all of the offerings that were meant for the demigods and that the demigods ultimately offered to Lord Vishnu. So when, when the Shringadev took out the intestines and placed them around his neck, he was allowing Hiranya Kashipu to give him those offerings. That was the way those offerings were, were given to Lord, Lord uh, Vishnu. So not only is the Lord extremely protective of his devotee, but he's also very merciful. Okay. So here's this demon, and he's getting purified by the Lord, and the Lord is actually allowing him to make this uh, rather ghastly, I think is the word, offering. And this is Lord Nishringade. He removes the obstacles to our devotional service. And he doesn't do that just for the devotee. Anyone who wants to make progress, um, the Lord, even, even if the, that desire is covered or you, know, you don't remember it from a past lifetime, but he fulfills that desire. So his mercy looks one way for Prahlad, like he's rescuing Prahlad, he's saving Prahlad from danger. Um, he's removing the obstacle to Prahlad's worship by taking Hiranya Kashipu out of the picture. He's also removing the obstacle to Hiranya Kashipu's worship. So when we're suffering, it, it may help to meditate and understand that the Lord has a purpose here. You know, something that I don't need is being taken away. Okay, so After he killed Hiranya Kashipu, Nishringadev, looking around, he's still in battle mode. Right? He's looking around, and Hiranya Kashipu's soldiers are like, eh, you know, I don't think so. Right? <laughs> so they take off. And, and Nishringadev's standing there, and there's no one left to fight. So he sits down on the throne, but he's still radiating that power and that anger. And everyone's afraid of him. So the demigods are offering prayers, trying to pacify him. You know, everybody goes through numerous prayers. Um, 
And then they tell Lakshmi Devi, okay, you know what? He's still upset. You, you're his wife. You go calm him down. Right? And Lakshmi Devi says, I can't approach him like this. You know, he's too angry. <coughs> so finally they ask Prahlad, the five-year-old boy, right? They say, okay, you talk to him. He came for you. <laughs> you talk to him. And Prabhupada says that, that this shows that there's a, there's a, a different relationship. Prahlad, the devotee, has a different relationship than even the demigods or Lakshmi Devi have with Lord Vishnu. It's more intimate. So one of the things that Prabhupada says about Prahlad is that he's a Mahajan. That means he's an example of what a Vaishnav should be like. He's an example of what a devotee should be like. So, and he also said that we can see ourselves in Prahlad. You know, that it's, it's not like Prahlad is way up here and we're way down here, so there's no use in us knowing how wonderful he is. Actually, this is something we can inspire for. So this intimacy, you know, this ability to approach the Lord in this intimate manner, even when he's outrageously angry, that other devotees may not have, we can aspire for that. That's pretty amazing. So Prahlad approaches the Lord, and he's five years old. You know, he doesn't know what to say or do. But the Lord, you know, puts his hand on his head, and and Mr. Gide feels such love for Prahlad. You know, such love for Prahlad. He picks him up, he puts him in his lap, and, and it said he, you know, because he's in the form of a lion, he licks him as a lion would lick its cub. Think about that. To have the Lord in the form of a lion licking your fist. That's the level of love and intimacy that's being offered to us. So if we take up this process of bhakti yoga, this process of purifying our hearts and learning to love the Lord, that's the level of love that, that we can, can have. All right, so then Prahlad offers prayers. And Prabhupada talks about, you know, how prayer is a very powerful process. So offering prayers to the Lord is an important process for us also. Because again, we're not just telling the story to hear about how cool Prahlad is, although he's very, very cool. Um, but we're also learning, you know, what should we be doing? Okay? And Prabhupada says that one should feel God is very great and I am very small. Therefore, my duty is to offer my prayers to the Lord. And there's a whole chapter of wonderful prayers that Prahlad Maharaj speaks. Um, and if you haven't read them, please read them. And if you have read them, please read them again. Please, and then I'll read them again. They're wonderful. But I wanted to pull just, just a few out. Um, one thing Prahlad says is, Therefore, although I was born in a demoniac family, I may without a doubt offer prayers to the Lord with full endeavor as far as my intelligence allows. Anyone who has been forced by ignorance to enter the material world may be purified of material life if he offers prayers to the Lord and hears the Lord's glory. Anyone. Okay. So there are a couple of things there. He, he says that He's, he, right, start that sentence all over again. Anyone who has been forced by ignorance to, to enter the material world. So he's taking some ownership of how he is in this situation. You know, I've been forced by ignorance to enter this material world. He's not thinking, why is this happening to me? Why isn't the Lord protecting me? Um, but more, in addition, and in my mind anyway, more important, we can be purified by, by hearing the Lord's glories and offering prayers to the Lord. And it doesn't require qualification. Okay? It's not if you have a BA or you were born in a certain place or you come from a certain family. Anyone, anyone can be purified by offering prayers and hearing the Lord's glories. So that's that's open. Another prayer he offers. O most powerful, insurmountable Lord, who is kind to the fallen soul. I have been put in the association of demons as a result of my activities, and therefore I am very much afraid of my condition of life within this material world. When will that moment come when you call me to the shelter of your lotus feet, which are the ultimate goal for liberation from conditional life? 
And Prabhupada says that this prayer should remind us that Krishna is always wanting to save us, that he's, he's going to save us. Prabhupada says that the, the real thing we need protection from is the miseries of material life, birth, death, disease, and old age. Mm -hmm. But that Krishna is Kripana Vatsala. Right? Kripana is a miserly person. Vatsala is the well-wisher, the one who, who rescues or takes care of. So Krishna wants us, even though we're fallen, even though we're materially conditioned, even though we're miserly people, even though we're denizens of Kali Yuga, he wants us to have a relationship with him. He wants to exchange the kind of love with us that he exchanged with Prahlad Maharaj. Prabhupada says, Krishna is extremely anxious to deliver us. So expect the mercy, right? Trust the process. Just like Prahlad kept surrendering to the Lord every time another calamity was visited upon him. He didn't at some point say, okay, you know what? <laughs> I don't understand why this keeps happening to me. Lord, where are you? you know, there was no point at which he was going to give up. We should also be like this. Right? Even though we fall short, we should continue to practice. We should continue to do those activities which purify our hearts. And because we're not pure devotees, because we're not at the level of Prahlad Maharaj, we're not going to remain undisturbed in the face of material anxiety. You know, if you do, please tell me your secret. Um, you know, so, but at the same time, if, even if we get discouraged, even if we're, you know, resentful towards the Lord, even if we're, you know, not living up to that highest standard, as long as we hold on to chanting the holy name, to associating with devotees, to serving devotees, to treating others respectfully, as long as we do these things, we are going to be delivered. So just don't let go of the process. The last prayer I'd like to, to speak is, is this one. My dear Lord, now I have complete experience concerning worldly opulence, mystic power, longevity, and other material pleasures enjoyed by all living entities from Lord Brahma down to the ants. Okay, so he's seen his father. I, I've seen it all. I've seen all the material enjoyment. As, power, as powerful time, you destroy them all. Therefore, because of my experience, I do not wish to possess them. My dear Lord, I request you to place me in touch with your pure devotee and let me serve him as a sincere servant. So this is pro what Prahlad says after the Lord says, I'm going to give you a benediction. What would you like? Prahlad's like, you know what? I, I have seen all of the material benedictions and I don't want them. But I want is to serve your devotee. So from somebody at the level of Prahlad Maharaj, who's a pure devotee, you know, that we are, are instructed to follow, he's putting this emphasis on serving devotees. And sometimes we take that for granted, at least I do. You know, there's so many devotees, some of y'all get on my nerves, right? Especially my husband. <laughs> you know. So it's like, you know, serve a devotee, all right, yeah, yeah. Um, this is how this is really important, you know, and that's I mean I'm joking, but that attitude I do have, you know, and I need to get rid of it. I need to be purified from it because the opportunity to serve a devotee is so valuable that we can't even imagine how blessed we are that we're able to serve the servants of the servants of the servants. So just to sum it up, I started out by asking, you know, how do we recognize a devotee? It's not based on the externalities, right? It, it's not based on, you know, how many um, rounds I chanted, or how many years I've been practicing, or what family I come from, or how many times I've read the Bhagavatam straight through. I've memorized the Bhagavad Gita, you know. All of these are wonderful things to do, and we should do them. But that's not the test. The test is internal. And, you know, to, it's not our job necessarily to identify, okay, you're a devotee, you're a devotee, you're kind of a devotee. That's not our job, right? Our job is to accept that we may not 
not really know where somebody else is at. And we're supposed to respect them anyway. Right? And if we're serving them thinking they're a devotee of Krishna, that's devotional service. Right? Where we're supposed to be looking is in our own heart. You know, am I, am I becoming humble? Am I developing love for the Lord? Am I developing faith that the Lord will take care of me? So when we be, begin to think in that way, then, then we should expect the mercy. We should expect that the Lord is going to help us. Because it's, as much as we want to go back to him, he's going to reciprocate with us. And he wants us to come back more than we can want to go to him. His desire for us to, to be in that loving relationship with him is beyond anything we can desire. So, by hook or by crook, even if he has to trick us, 